Let's get stuck into it. Look who's here, the diamond. I don't, I don't want to talk fights at the start of this, okay? I want to talk hot sauce. That's what I want to talk about, man. <laughs> You're looking around. You, have you got some merchandise? I thought I had a, I thought I had a bottle here at this table that I, I can show you. I can grab one real quick. But yeah, let's talk hot sauce. Come on, man. Because I'm seeing this more often now. Fighters um, in the world of business, becoming entrepreneurs, doing different things. Why hot sauce? I love to cook. I love uh, I love food. I'm from Louisiana. Louisiana hot sauce is a big thing, you know. And uh, why not is the question. <laughs> it's it 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 honestly started uh, around March, April, beginning of the of the lockdown of the pandemic. I was stuck at home cooking and you know just bored, and I figured I would I would give it a shot. And uh, yeah, and and we have the final product now. How, how hot is hot sauce though? Is it is it like blow your head off hot sauce? Is it a mild thing? Where was it at? For me, this is mild. I don't know. Everybody's a little different, right? But I eat a lot of spicy stuff in Louisiana. This is very mild. I think uh, anyone can enjoy this. It's not blow your head off. This is flavor. This is flavor. <laughs> For fans actually watching this, who'll be maybe who don't know too much about what you're getting up to, you can people in the UK can get this, can't you? You're shipping worldwide. So if people wanted shipping, to order it, you can. Worldwide. Yeah. Anybody yeah. can get this. There you go. Get yourself a little bit of that. Spice up your turkey for Christmas. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the Dusty Poirier hot sauce, man. All good. Uh, right. Before we get stuck into 257, um, I want to go all the way back to 242, if that's okay. Because that's the last time that me and you actually sat down and we, we, we had a conversation there. Uh, and I remember after the fight, um, you were incredibly emotional and you were obviously extremely good to come out and, and, and speak to us at that point. I want to talk about the pickup off the back of a defeat like that that takes so much out of you emotionally because it was evident that you were emotionally drained off the back of it. How long and what is the process for a fighter that has built himself up a fantastic record to get himself into that situation? How long is the process then of getting back on the horse? For, for me, it's, uh, you know, it, it's not just like I'm upset because I lost that night. I'm upset because all the years it took to even get to that, to be in that position, you know, all the, all the sacrifice and all the losses and, and, you know, the peaks and valleys of just to get to that moment and, and, and to, to fumble on a, a night like that. It just hurts, man. It hurts. Cause I know what the, I know what the victory means for not just myself, my legacy, but for my family, for the people I'm fighting for, it, it means a lot. You know, this is deeper than just a pay-per-view tune in and watch these two guys fight. This is my life. You know, it's, it's a moment of my life captured on film, but it's so much, it's rooted so deep what, what happens, um, win or lose. So that just all hits me a, a after, you know, leading up to the fight, going into these kind of fights, you're just tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. But after the event, win or lose, then reality hits you when you walk to the back and, and you're, you're now in this position that you have to digest all of these, everything that's happening. You know, what's the next step? Where do we go from here? Uh, all that type of stuff. So for me, I usually just get back in the gym. You know, honestly, that's the best way for me to deal with defeats is just to submerge myself and invest everything into getting better, into training. It kind of blurs out all the noise, blurs out all the negative thoughts. I just get back to training, get back to working all day. And, and that kind of has always helped me in the past. Mm -hmm. And for this particular one, I did a little bit of that right at the beginning, and then uh, I had to have a hip surgery. So I was side. So this is the first time I've taken a, a defeat and had to really just sit there and think about it. I couldn't put weight on my leg for eight um, eight weeks, you know. So I was just sitting watching watching the fights, watching the UFC, watching these guys compete, and just you know just a lot of mental training. So everything happens for a reason, and I feel like I've developed, uh, you know, not just as a fighter. But just as a man, uh, from those eight weeks of sitting down on the sidelines, from that loss, as I do in all wins and losses, I, I take stuff with me. And I'm sitting here in front of you, a better person, a more mature person, and, and ready to go again. Well, the, the word that you used there was mature. And I know that it was kind of forced because of the hip surgery, so therefore you were physically out of the picture for a short period of time. But because you were forced to do that, kind of reading you as a character, I would have no doubt you'd have been itching to get straight back in the octagon, to right the wrong, to get in there and get another win. And sometimes you can rush those types of things, and I'm sure you would have done that in your younger career. Being forced to stay on the sideline helped, I think, from a mental and emotional point of view to process it all and then come back the way that you did against Dan Hooker, because that performance was sensational. 
Thank you so much, man. And you, you're right. You, and you know what it, it did? It it uh it, it put fighting in perspective to me because always, you know, for the last 13, 14 years, I've I've just done it all day, every day, fight, get back in the gym, fight, 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 train, fight. It's just been my whole life. And I kind of I didn't lose touch of how much I love this and need this, but I was just so caught up in the day-to-day motions of being a fighter and trying to get better that I just didn't even think about it. This was just normal life. But being sidelined after a loss, after the biggest loss of my career, you know, it, it really made me realize that there's no other place I'd rather be, you know, so, than, than in the gym, sweating, training, under somebody, trying to get back up in uncomfortable positions. I didn't know how much I needed that in my life until I was forced away from it. And that just makes me appreciate uh, the, the, the process more now, I really do believe. How much did you need as well the fight with a top contender like Dan in the in the middle of the year and for it to play out the way that it played? Because a lot of people will have that down on their fights of the year contenders, no doubt about it. And you came out victorious that night. I knew, you know, I was excited to get another fight, get another fight against a top um, top ranked opponent who's been looking good. You know, he was on a streak. He just won a main event over another contender. And uh, yeah, it was a tough fight. I knew I knew Dan was tough. We all knew Dan was tough. It was a little bit grittier than I would like it to be, but that's that's fighting, man. That's fighting. It's a weird thing, man. Because I say I'm not going to speaking as a fan. No, no, no. I like him gritty like that. That's right, the- yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, for sure. I, and that's the weird thing. I, I say I don't want to do that, and then I like it too. <laughs> it shows on your face, though, because there was a moment in round two, which again people will be voting on whether that is round of the year because it was sensational. There was a moment in there where there's violence going on all over the place and you're actually laughing and smiling like, I don't know, you're playing down the park or something. It was, it's, it's for, for a fan just to observe that, it's quite a crazy situation. You know, because uh, that's what I really enjoy, man. That's like the pure, you can only get that feeling, that pressure from being in the, in the center of, of that kind of fight at that moment. It, it's a drug. And, and uh, you know, when I get in those positions, I really... I, after fights like that, it's weird. It sounds corny, but dude, I am grateful to have gone through that because I remember being a young kid and watching the greats on TV and saying, you know, I just want to be part of fights like that. Mm. And for some, some, somehow I, I find myself in them often. I don't know if it's good for me, if it's too good for me, but man, what a ride it is. And uh, I love it because I know, I know I'm a real fighter. When those moments hit, if you're not a real fighter, you don't, you don't continue, you, you lose. And uh, a lot of these guys scream that they're fighters and love the lifestyle and love the, to be on that pedestal. But I, I would say less than 20% of them really want to be in that moment. And I, I'm one of those guys that want to be in that moment. Well, we've got another moment coming up uh, in January. Before I get to that, though, how close were we to seeing you on Fight Island the last time? Because there was a lot of rumors, a lot of chat, especially on social media, that you and maybe Tony were going to get it on at some point. Yeah, I mean, it was close. We just couldn't get a deal done for that particular date. And that's just how it goes, you know, it's business. What, how, how did the whole process, because it kind of played out on social media where people were talking about the finances and various things like that. And that's your own personal business. And then you get a guy from a different franchise in Michael Chandler being brought in as the reserve. You're the guy that was probably on, all right. I know there's the Habib situation there, but you were the guy that's on the, the most, the best run of, of, of stellar contenders. I know that Tony had a decent run as well, but you had the best stellar contenders in there. So how did it make you feel that uh, that, that situation was being played out? You know, of course, I, I had a lot of thoughts about it. I didn't like it at first. Then uh, I step away and try to remove my emotions from the situation because it is business. This is business transactions. Uh and I became happy for Michael Chandler. Good for him to finally get an opportunity, you know, to maybe make the money he's looking to make and fight what everyone thinks are the best guys in the world. Because he was doing great before. He was beating tough guys. You know, he's a, he's a good fighter. Mm-hmm. But here's an opportunity to finish his career in the biggest organization in the world and, and prove his, his worth to the people who say Bellator's B-League or whatever they say. You know, so I was just happy for him. Good, good for him because he seems like he's doing it right, you know. What is your opinion of the current landscape of the lightweight division? Because we don't really know what's going on with the champ. I know that he's 
said that he's retired. There's lots of conversations that Dana and Habib will meet again at some point and maybe have a conversation before you and Conor meet in, in January. What's your opinion of the landscape right now? I mean, it's been murky, man. This this has been uh, a, a top-heavy division for, for a while now with crazy things always happening. People, you know, the top guys getting suspended, um, retirements. It's just been really crazy. I think it's the toughest division in the UFC. Yeah. Um, the best, the best fighters are here, and getting it's getting more interesting now with uh, Charles Oliveira looking incredible, and he's a longtime vet. You know, he's got a lot to prove, and uh, he's paid his dues, and it's 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 paying off. So it's I don't I don't really know, man. I can't look at the whole thing. I don't know what's going to happen. I feel like Khabib's a guy of his word. If he says he's retired, he's yeah. most likely retired. Um, you know, number two is Gaethje. I got a win over him. I, I feel like me and Connor could potentially be for the belt. You know, he, he's a former champion. And uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It must be it must be hard. For, from an emotional point of view, it must be difficult. Because I agree with you. I think Habib is a man of his word. And whether it's a short period or a long period, I don't think we're going to see him in the octagon anytime soon. But that then becomes unfair on the, the shark tank that you are in because there's some sensational contenders there that all have eyes on gold, you being one of those. And a lot of fans could take a step back and have a look at the fight that is booked for January 23rd, and they could make legitimate arguments that that is well worthy of, of, a, of a fight having the title on the line. I agree. Um, I'm a former interim champion looking to get some gold back around my ways. Connor's a former undisputed world champion uh, in the lightweight division. Uh, both of our last defeats were to the the current retired champion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't know, you know, there, there's a storyline you can draw with a lot of these fights. And I just try not to play too much into it because at the end of the day, January 23rd, I'm fighting 25 minutes with one of the best guys in the world. And I just focus on that. You know, everything else is just noise. I, I have no control of those stuff, but what I do have control of is the work I just put in right before I hopped on this call with you, the work I'm going to put in after, after we hang up here. Um, you know, my preparation and, and my, my readiness, that's what I'm focused on. Everything else, what's going to happen is going to happen. I can't control it. 2014 is a long time ago. 145 is a long time ago as well, my man. You've been on this amazing run at 155. Talk me through, I, I personally don't think physically um, and ability-wise, don't take this the wrong way, that, they, that that's where the improvements are with Dustin Poirier, because I think they've always been there. My observations, just as a fan, uh, from an emotional standpoint, I was just watching some tape recently of interviews that you used to do, and you used to be really emotionally invested in fight week and various things like that, especially the Connor week at 178. Whereas now, speaking to you on a fight week, you're so calm, you're so cool, you're so collected. Would you say that that is the thing that has changed the most, the way that you are emotionally investing yourself into, into fight weeks and, and fight camps? Yeah, for sure. I mean... I think six years is a long time to to be better tech technically. You yeah, know, yeah. I think I, I've, I've technically got a lot better, and uh, my fight IQ, besides giving up positions on guillotines, which I would not stop doing, um, I think overall I, I've, I've evolved a lot as a fighter, as a martial artist, and and a part of that evolution is is the mental side of fighting. Yeah, yeah, mate, I I, I can see it, especially from. Like I said, that fight week of 178, where you did seem incredibly emotionally invested. Is, is that the big take that you take away from the first fight? That emotional investment that you gave to those moments, whereas now I think... I, get... I save it for the fight. I'm, I'm wasting energy. I'm wasting uh, mind space, if you will, all that fight week. You know, we're going to, at, like I said, at the end of the other week, we're going to fight. There's no reason to, to get myself all crazy and get in my head. We're fighting. The work's done. We just got to finish this thing out and, and uh, get into the octagon healthy. So I just put less into it. I care less. If, if you, you know, I know it sounds weird. It probably sounds like to, to a casual, it might sound like uh, I'm not as invested as I was, but this is still my main thing, fighting. But I've said this a hundred times before, but I'm a father, a husband, um, a business owner, an entrepreneur, a son, a brother. I've got so many hats, man, and fighting is just one of them. It's something that, that takes most of my time. It's something that I'm, I'm most dedicated to. Um, because I know the benefits it has for everyone around me. Mm. So I, I'm I'm 100% invested in this, but at the same time, 
it, it's not who I am anymore. That I was only fighting back then. Now this is just something I do. I put everything into it. I hope for the best. I bust my ass. I believe in myself. But this is just a fight. You know, of course, there's there's high stakes on the line. I can get seriously injured. Um, you know, this isn't taken lightly. I understand what comes with it more so now than I ever have. Do you know something? I'm, I'm, I love that answer. And you brought something up there that I want to throw towards you. Maybe maybe you have thought about this. Maybe you haven't thought about this. Do you, th do you think that maturity has coincided with parenthood? Yeah, patience has. No doubt about it in my mind, patience has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's a, I guess, it's a virtue that I, that I don't think I, I had. It's a virtue I didn't have. It is and amazing. I'm still learning it. Mate, it's amazing what having children does to you. Because I'm looking at your career, right? And I can see um, the... The fight, for example, with Michael Johnson. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, that fight took place literally a month after your daughter was born. Am yeah. I right? In and around yeah. that time? Yeah. So me being a dad myself, I'm thinking, that's a life-changing moment. Why is that guy in the octagon? You know, because your head, could not, there's no possible way your head was in the octagon that night. You, you were somewhere else, man. Obviously, that's not taken away from Michael, but I'm just saying, as a parent, that's how I would look at that. And then if you look at the fights after it, you've just gone like that through the roof. So it seems quite obvious that becoming a parent has really influenced what you're now doing inside the octagon. Yeah, like the, the patience, I, I said, was, was a big lesson, but I think it was just a better balance. Like I was saying before, yeah. all I was was a fighter. Now when I come home, I'm a dad and fighting's not so much in the forefront uh, of my brain. It's, it's always glooming. I can never get away from it. It's always there no matter what I'm doing. Talking to you right now, I'm thinking about the fight. If I go play with my daughter, I'm going to be th in the back of my head, even though I'm not directly focused on those thoughts, I'm, it's there. I can't get it's a it's a it's a fog that I just cannot get out of my brain until after I fight. You know, it, it's 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 there. It's always looming over me. But the balance of coming home and being a dad and playing with Barbies and going to the <laughs> pool with my daughter, it just breaks up the 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 strain of being a fighter 24 seven. You know, it's about life's about balance. And it's definitely helped me, man. Mate, that's a YouTube channel. You, hot sauce, and Barbies, all right? Maybe we could get some type of cooking channel going on or something, you know? Let's go. <laughs> um, how did this fight come about? Because we saw it all playing out on social media, charity exhibitions and various things like that. Was that the first part of the conversation? Did that, is that how it all kicked off? Yeah, that, I don't think... Uh, on Connor's part, he was, he was serious about putting on an event in uh, Ireland. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it started. And then obviously a couple of phone calls led to with management and what have you. And we ended up, uh, we ended up getting this knock on, uh, on, on January 23rd. Again, a totally different fight because you're both in very different places. It's a different weight. You've all developed as mixed martial artists. It's a phenomenal way to kick off 2021. I can't wait, man. I can't wait. Off the back of a fight of this magnitude, out in Abu Dhabi as well. That's another thing because you've had experience. You've been out there. You've you've experienced fighting, uh, fighting overseas. It'd be interesting to see whether there's fans or what have you. So maybe the fight week could be very very different. Have you considered? And I know this isn't official as of yet. Have you considered the time difference because you may have to fight at some crazy time in Abu Dhabi local time in order to, you know, um, contest. I believe, uh, what I, yeah, that's kind of a a hectic area when I think about it because. I do want to go there earlier because, you know, last time I fought on uh, UAE time, they wanted the pay-per-view to be live in Russia and, and Abu Dhabi. They wanted their time to be live. So it was mm -hmm. midday in America. I think it's, it's, the, it's the switcheroo on this one. I think they want this to be live American time. So I'm planning to go early, but I don't know why I'm going to go early to get scheduled on, on their time yeah. to fight. At our time, you know, I'll be fighting probably 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Abu Dhabi time. So it's live here in America. I, I don't know what's going on. I'm just rolling with the punches, man. I, I Hoping for the best. Last time I went out there and fought, uh, we fought on Abu Dhabi time, like I said. And I went out there nine days, nine nights, eight full days ahead. And it wasn't enough. Yeah. It wasn't enough. Yeah, the time difference from you to them is quite bad, isn't it? You know what I mean? You're probably, you're, you're probably right with what you said. A full two weeks if you were fighting their local time. But then it would make sense. If you're going to be fighting in your time anyway. I don't know what's going on. We're, <laughs> we're fighting. I tell you that. We're fighting. So we're having a fight. That's it. That's we're all fighting. good. Um, that's 
What's the, what's the situation um, with Mike Brown? Because I know that, obviously, he's committed to another fighter. He's gone to Japan, if I'm not mistaken. He's out there right now, so I believe that he's having a little bit of time out there. Is he going straight from Japan to Abu Dhabi? What's he do? How's it all playing out, man? So he's going to he's gonna corner Kyoji Horiguchi in the uh, Ryzen show or Risen show in, uh, I think it's the first of the year. Then he's yeah. going to come back to American Top Team. I believe we're going to spend one more week here. And then uh, head to Vegas to start the quarantine process around somewhere around the 8th to the 11th and get to Abu Dhabi, you know, a day after. And the family planning on staying in Florida for Christmas or are you going back to Lafayette? What are you doing? Yeah, well, it, it kind of sucks. We're, uh, I, had, I had to miss Thanksgiving with them. And the last few years, I got to spend Thanksgiving with everybody. For the yeah. first time in my career, I had like a run of three Thanksgivings in a row where I was home. It was great. Uh, but, you know, usually I come out here and do 10 days or so by myself just to get in the motion. And then my wife and daughter meet me here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but we're, we're currently building a, a home in Louisiana. So my wife had to stay back to finish up some paperwork and, and make sure some things were right. So it was almost three weeks I was here by myself at the beginning of training camp. So I was going crazy, man, without my girls. But uh, they're here with me. We're all good. Yeah, we're, but, but for Christmas, we're staying here. It's a small sacrifice. I would love to have my daughter back home with grandmothers and cousins and enjoying Christmas. But this is just part of the journey, and and uh, I'm I'm grateful to be working. I'm grateful to be preparing for for a big fight like this, and that's something I, I've learned is just to try to stay in a place of gratitude, and things are a lot smoother, man. Listen, Santa Santa Claus knows where you are, man. He'll find that little girl. Don't you worry about we, it. We uh, she was she was worried about it because we don't have a fireplace here at at the condo in Florida. <laughs> but uh, we got it all squared away. We, she wrote Santa a letter, let him know where she was gonna be. We're good to go. That's it, man. That's it. It's magic key or something like that. You know what I mean? If there's no fireplace, magic key. So it's, he'll, yeah. he'll get. He'll, no, he'll, he'll, yeah, he'll come in through the window like right. brother man. <laughs> uh, listen, all the best, man. We're so looking forward to this fight. Cannot wait for it to go down on uh, on January 23rd. Have a healthy camp. Stay well. Stay away from this crazy pandemic. And we'll hopefully uh, see you in Abu Dhabi doing your thing, Dustin. You definitely will see that. Thank you, guys.